The name of my presentation is Seven Succession and Exit Planning Pitfalls. So let's not think about that too much because that's not really what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, this is a little different presentation than the rest of them. Uh, being the last one of the day, that's probably good. I'll try to end on time. Um, but what this is really about is your life and your practice. Uh, so we're going to talk about succession and exit planning for your practice. And this isn't, I don't want this to be theoretical. It's going to be a little bit, but this is about you. So, you know, when you graduated high school, and went to college, you had a chance to grow and change yourself some. Can't say if you did or didn't, but you had that opportunity. When you graduated law school and got your job, whatever it was, or went out on your own if you were unemployable like me, you had an opportunity to grow and change yourself. This is another opportunity to grow and change yourself. And like any opportunity to grow and change yourself, it probably works better if you plan. So we're going to actually do a plan today. It's a 15-minute plan. I'll explain why we're going to do it in that time period also. There's a reason for that too. Um, as we talk about, as, I, as I'm talking about the theory and things you should be doing, hopefully you will be applying it right to yourself. For those of you who love your electronic devices, the handout is also in PDF, a fillable PDF form on Jen's site. So I will also mention that. Um, I would much rather at this point type than try to scrawl in those little boxes. Um, so either method is available to you if you uh, prefer your electronics. So uh, just a touch about me. Um, and why I uh, am somewhat qualified to do this presentation. Uh, that was me on my marriage day to my wife, marriage day. Um, my wife is by far the smarter and the detail-oriented. I'm sort of big picture and broad. It actually works very well as a team. Um, but the last 20 years, I have been doing both business valuation and business brokerage. And because of that, I have a very different perspective of business valuation, particularly when somebody's going to take it and try to exit off it, than a lot of valuators who have never been out there and actually had to match out what they told the judge to a real world situation. We need both, and they're different assignments. But because of that, um, I believe I have a little more pra practicality because I've never seen a buyer say, it's not 24% cap rate, it's 22.5. We're gonna adjust it 100,000. It doesn't work that way. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how it really works um, today. Uh, before I did this, I did transactional law for about six years. Uh, before I did that, I grew up in a construction family I, was, I got out of law school and got hired as a construction project manager uh, because my dad ran a huge operation and showed me how things really worked. Um, so I've sat on every side of the deal table except being the banker. Um, so again, I come at this from a little different perspective. I wrote a book. Um, Alan Zip was aware of it. I think that's why he suggested me for this. It's a real book published by Wiley. This is on valuing small businesses and practices under 10 million. We certainly know how to value larger ones. We understand how to do discounting. We understand family limited partnerships. But I felt there was a need in the market um, for the really small. When people say small business, they're talking 100 million of revenues. And yes, that is a small business compared to public companies. But most of the practices and many of our clients are under 10 million, and it's a different world. So that was the purpose of that. It is a technical valuation book. It has a chapter on some of what I'm talking about today, um, but it was really a book for valuators for valuators. 
my next venture, I'm starting peer groups for professionals. I am doing my exit planning. Don't have a real good exit from business brokerage at the volume I want to do it at. Um, I built a valuation practice. I feel like I have a lot in kin with professional practice owners. What happens at peer groups? You know, when you're driving down the road in the morning and boom, out of nowhere, you get the solution to the problem, whatever it is, your employee, your client's issue, like out of nowhere, maybe you get it after you exercise or when you wake up in the morning. You will have more of those participating in a peer group. That's really what it does. It's an opportunity to stir those thoughts in your brain. And with Zoom, we can put together really good groups of fairly competing people easily. Um, we're gonna go to the first polling question. Because the way we're doing this technology, you can't see it, but I'm gonna read it to you. And then ask you to raise your hands as the people in the audience are doing their thing. Um, I have talked to my key people for an hour or more about my exit in the past year. How many can say yes? Okay, maybe 30 or 40%. So I assume the rest of you are no. Now, how many of you have it as part of your annual planning process? This is a bonus. Um, or you have a buyout in place, so at least in theory, it's handled and you're free to talk about it to people subject to it. How many? I know a couple of the big firms do. Okay, wonderful. And online, it was kind of similar. 33% have. Um, as you're going to see, at least from my point of view, that's a missed opportunity. Uh, but we'll talk about how we make it available to you and your people. So we did call this the seven pitfalls, or I did. And the first pitfall is the laws of gravity don't apply to me. I was actually looking at getting little pocket mirrors so you could look at yourself because for most of you, the biggest impediment to your exit, you will see in the mirror when you brush your teeth in the morning because we all believe the laws of gravity don't apply. Doesn't apply to me either. I am gonna live forever. My clients are counting on me and would be terrified of my perfectly qualified associate. We all have these fears. Um, and they interfere with doing the planning for what we want to do next. So because of this, being convinced that gravity doesn't affect us, is 70% of all businesses don't sell. And it's not just little ones. You'll notice below it, 50% of the businesses with revenues between 10 and 50 million don't sell. That's kind of amazing. Um, and it's also, if you remember when we have the recessions, it happens. Um, it, uh, it just does. As I like to say, if you're always miserable, worn out, have no free time, because you're working so hard, because you got to do everything, why would your kids, why would your managers want to buy you? So think about that as we get into the details. What do you really want? even as you continue on in your practice, if you're a long way away. And, you know, we have two big parts of how we think. And I love this picture. You know, the question is, which man is smaller? And now you all know, analytically, the guy on the bottom left, bottom right to you, this guy looks smaller. But you all know, I wouldn't be asking you that if it wasn't rigged. Your gut is saying, Greg's got a trick here. Well, this is a very famous optical illusion. And the two men, obviously the one is bigger. The two smaller men are the exact same size. And I've measured it and measured it and measured it because my brain doesn't believe it when, because we take shortcuts. But we're a very analytical group. And because of that, we can convince ourselves of anything we want because we're really smart and we know how to put together arguments that are really good. But what happens when people exit plan is at some point they do what they want. They go with their gut. The only exception is a lot of men are gonna do what their wife 
helps them decide. So, and I find that more with men than women, the biggest burly contractor, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. He comes back and says, wife says I'm not selling. He's not selling. Um, so part of the reason I want you to complete this form in the different pieces quickly is because that's more likely to be from what you've got, from your gut. Because when, like I said, when push comes to shove, you're going to have a million reasons why you don't execute that plan, I guarantee. Um, and you're even going to have a million reasons why you shouldn't fill out this form. Uh, but we'll talk about that in just a second. So the first step is about you personally. Now, it's about when you retire, I will do. What do you want to do? My dad retired at 56. And when I called him from work in the morning, he had been up and at him for two hours. He had things to do. He had things to do till he went to sleep at 10. There are other things to do. There's charities, there's fun things, there's arts. You know, there's many, many, what do you want? You can work part-time. You know, I don't really ever intend to 100% retire. I also don't intend to work 60 hours, 50, 60 hours a week for forever. So write down what you would like to do Write down why you want to. There's this concept of things pulling you versus being pushed. You know, if you have a mandatory retirement because you work at the big firm of 70, well, they're pushing you out the door at 70. Most of us aren't, don't have that. So why do we want to do this? What will pull us towards it? What is exciting that we don't get to do in today's life? And then the last one is, let's face it, why do you resist? Why do you resist filling out this form? Why do you resist putting a plan in place? Why do you resist talking to your employees and your clients when the time is right? And we'll talk about that in a few minutes in a little bit too. So fill that out. And we have the next polling question, which ties into the next section I'm going to cover. I know my key financial and management goals and metrics. I review them quarterly and regularly grow the top and bottom line. Now, how many people do that? How many have people have them written down? Okay, one. Very good. We've got the, uh, the doctor, the dentist with rotten teeth. Um, obviously, plans help. I have a bonus that you actually do this with your team regularly. Uh, it, it sounds like that's really rare error. And online, five people said yes. So apparently online are, or, you know, they're either, they're either lawyers fudging the definitions or uh, they're a little more on the ball than in the room. Okay, pitfall number two. Your ATM is out of service too often. Now, what do I mean by this? My son, I, my oldest boy, when he was little, he was like baby Huey. I mean, he was this tall when he was three, and he was clumsy. And one day he comes up to me with this deep voice. He goes, Daddy, I know how we get money. We go to the ATM. That's true. That's what he saw. And people who are buying your practice, think about it. You go to the ATM, you put a card in, you push some numbers, and the money comes out. It's a system. Now, you got to put some money in, but it's a system that produces money. And think how upset. Not so much anymore because everything's gone to cards. But back when you actually needed some cash in your pocket, when you went to the ATM and it didn't work, Think how upsetting, you know, oh my God, now I got to go to the ATM that's going to charge me a fee or there isn't another one around. The same way with your business. If, if the ATM isn't working or if it's way up and down, you're going to have a penalty. So the standard of value in business valuation, we're always talking standard of value. That's sort of the deal terms real short. 
Who's my buyer? Who's my seller? How long do we have to put this together? Well, for transactions, it's repeatable future cash flow so strong I'll pay for it in advance. Think about that. Think what you need to do to be that comfortable and that trusting of putting down, you know, a hundred thousand, a half million, two million that your house is guaranteed on, perhaps. So again, it ties into cash flow, how much money, and the multiplier is the risk. And the way we really increase value is we work both sides of the equation. We raise our cash flow while we're reducing our risk. The highest way we raise it, but it may not be possible for those of us in our room, is to come up with intellectual property that can be at very low cost, resold many times. You know, the problem with a billable hour, no matter how high we raise it, is we've only got so many of them, but Microsoft can sell us copies of their software unlimited at almost no cost once it's produced. So businesses that can do that, and I've seen some, um, people who produce information for like grocery stores, people, we buy all this kind of stuff in valuation. You buy all this stuff for tax information. You know, once that's on there, I can sell it to you a hundred times and it doesn't cost me any more. Those people get very high multipliers. We'll talk about what these look like in a bit. So again, sales price or value, but price is different than value. Price is you and I make a deal. Value is sort of what it's supposed to be with, by reasonable people. It's the last 12 to 18 months rolling. How much money are you really making now? Think of it like if you have a salesperson. If you've ever had a salesperson and they're having a bad two or three years and they go, but five years ago, I was so good. You're like, who cares? What are you selling for me tomorrow? Well, your business is the same way. They're looking at future cash flows. What's going on tomorrow? And uh, we'll talk about the different cash flows a little bit, a little later. But what buyers care about is how much do I have to pay? If you have a law practice with no non-competes, because that's what the Constitution has been interpreted as saying, and you're a year out and you haven't talked to your associate about buying you out under something, you gave it to them. Let's be real. Why would he pay you for what he's going to get if you're really in a year retiring or if you get sick? Again, um, it's what does that person have to pay? And uh, we can talk about, I can talk about value all day long. But if you let yourself get in a box, you may, have a, you may not get the price, the value you deserve. So basically... Business is, I call it the working model, the ATM. It's profits, processes, and people. How much money? We talked about that's cash flow. And then processes and people. How do we reduce risk? If you're the only person that can do 60% of your caseload and the only person that can sell it and the only person whatever, that's a lot of risk to anybody looking at it. Now, fortunately, if you're have an accounting firm that does repeat work, you're going to be able to sell it. You just may not get to take care of your employees the way you want. You may not, you know, have your customers taken care of the way you want, but you will get a price because you've got repeating work. Lawyers, it's not quite so easy. What my dad always said was quality systems exist when average people because we can't always hire the top 2% of the class. When average people get extraordinary results every time, and they were doing a billion dollars a year of office buildings, of, in condos and hotels. So it was the people way down the chain doing the work. Quality people, qu average people with excellent, extraordinary results every time. The other thing he always said, being a general contractor, was make money today. Make money today. Good thing to think about if you're trying to increase the value as you head towards this, towards an exit, or frankly, anytime you're running a business.
We can always, we're smart people. We can always have a reason why we had a bad year. But we'll never put that money back in our pocket. Now, I have my apple here because people come to me all the time and they go, Greg, it has so much potential. Well, my apple here has a couple seeds in it and I got those seeds for free. Now, I could go buy a little package of seeds. I have no idea what they cost anymore. And in 10 years, I'll have an apple tree. But I don't pay for the tree. I pay for the seed or maybe the apple if I want to eat the apple. Same way with you. If you don't have potential, they won't be interested. They'll just go get a job. But they're not going to pay you for the potential. They pay you for what exists. Very quickly with small businesses, part of the reason, you know, we just had a pandemic. Hopefully, we all think it's ending. Hopefully, it is. Walmart, Target, Costco, you know, they grew. The local sport, out good, outdoor goods store was closed, even though people wanted to buy their stuff. Small businesses, including yours, have concentrations. You can only have so many practice areas and do it well. You can only have a geographical area, especially with our licensing of your law, and, and do it well or do it at all without finding a partner. That puts us at risk. We, Robin and I, spend a lot of time in Steamboat. The hotels in Steamboat, well, they didn't do great. They did a heck of a lot better than the ones in New York City by our Princeton home, our Princeton location area home. Hilton, well, it got hurt. You know, it's got them all over the place. It's averaging out, much less risk. And again, you're your biggest risk. Some of these other issues, they certainly exist, but we're not going to spend time on them today. Um, I think I've covered, this is a little more detail of what's really on this page. Um, and these, you know, mistakes, real estate leases. If you're going to get bought by a bigger firm in the area, you probably would like to be able to get out of your lease as soon as possible because they're probably going to want to move you and that's an expense. Of course, if you're running a retail, you know, I sold a Jackson Hewitt and it does taxes. It's not exactly like what's in this room, but it was some of the same forms. They were retail oriented. They needed their spaces. You know, their location was very important. So again, if it's a mess, if, if your financials are bad, if your office you know, it looks like the green shade accountant where the wall hasn't been painted in 20 years and you got the metal, the gray metal, file boxes, and it's not going to excite a buyer. They'll buy it. It's not going to excite young kids coming out of college either, frankly. Um, last thing I will mention on this part, because people always want to know, accounting is a little different. It will often sell based on revenues. But I believe that's because I can go in, look, if I'm an accountant, this is what I do. I can go look at your files and I can figure out what my time's going to be. And if it makes sense and I can make a profit, you know, your profit is less of a concern as what I can make because I can estimate that if I, if I go through enough of your files. But most businesses sell on their cash flow. The two cash flows are EBITDA, earnings, before interest, depreciation, and amortization. And what that is about is that's a fully managed business. The owner should get reasonable compensation, maybe not what he or she is making, but what the market, I always look at it as if they merged into a really big company, what would that job for this piece get paid? And whatever's left is EBITDA. And it's three to seven times EBITDA. Um, is a typical range. Law is probably lower because there's so much personal goodwill, especially if you don't sell where you're going to be there five years or four years to transfer it. Smaller businesses, we include the single owners, everything they're making plus EBITDA. So it's every way one owner makes money. Um, and they sell for 1.5 to three times in the market I know best, Maryland, 2.2 um, is the average. 2.8 to 3 is kind of the high end. Um, a, a, a relatively profitable accounting practice should be making their owners 25 to 
So three times equals your one times revenue. Sometimes there's mathematical sense in the world. And then frankly, again, most businesses don't have a value. They're gonna close. You know, somebody is just getting by or just making a salary and working too hard. So on the second step, look at your practice. From five being the worst to one being the best, how good an ATM do you have? Do you have good systems in place? Are there, are there people who can fill in for you? Is there somebody else that can sell? Now, if you're smaller, it's going to get teared down a little bit. But I can tell you, a good paralegal who knows where the bones are buried is a whole lot more valuable than the paralegals retiring the same day you do. You know, I get that all the time. The owner's 65, his management team is 63. And when you ask him, what are you doing? Oh, Bob goes, I go. Who's going to run the thing? People need people. We can, we can get leases. We can get equipment. We can buy inventory. People that can actually make things run and are trained, run those systems, they're hard. So what's your cash flow this year? What do you think the cash, or what was it last year? What's it going to be this year? Already talked about, that's really important. And what's the next thing to improve? You don't need 18. What's that big improvement? You know, the 80-20 rule. We can do lists and lists of things, but two or three big things are going to give us 80% of our improvement. Look at that. Okay, this is what I get all the time with some of you, some of my friends who come to this conference who aren't here or come to other, the NACVA, the valuation, I'm very active in that, um, ran a, I retired this month from it, ran for four and a half years, I ran their two hour a month webinar, found the people to attend, ran the thing um, for continuing education. You know, a lot of those guys, they're the same type of room, more accountants, but similar room. No options, or I'm, and it sounds more like this. I'm keeping my options open by not doing anything. You know, if I don't do anything, they're all open. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's sort of like, whoops. It's sort of like, you know, you want to get married and have a big wedding, and we're going to plan it two weeks before. What could go wrong? What? So here's a few options, and there's a lot of variations of these options. You can sell to associates. Now you need some associates. And you also need associates that want to buy. People hire me all the time to do evaluation because their associates are going to buy them out. And I say, have you talked to your associates? Well, sometimes it's even no. Usually it's yes. And I say, well, what did you talk about? And they say, I asked them if they would like to own some of, some of the practice. And what they heard was, I'm going to get a bonus plan. I'm getting profit sharing. They don't hear I'm signing the personal guarantees with the bank. I'm signing the lease. I'm taking all this risk. It's all on my shoulders. When you have that conversation, make sure you really explain what you mean. If you're looking to hire someone who might be that person, make sure they understand when you say ownership, you mean in three or five or seven years, they're getting the good and the bad. There's reasons you stay up at night and they don't. Let's face it. Um, but that has a lot of flexibility. The other thing is if you want them to buy you out and not take back the financing, you got to help them make the money before the closing date because the bank isn't going to lend to somebody that has nothing. Even SBA isn't going to lend to somebody with nothing. And I see that all the time. Nesting. What nesting is, and, and this works really well, because one of the problems we have with small practices is if I'm selling you my practice and, I, and I'm going to work full time, I want to get paid full time. Well, if I'm selling off the value of my earnings, including my salary, I can't double pay. So in nesting, what you do is you sit down with your buyer and they look at you look at all your overhead costs, including your assistants, your receptionists, whatever they are, and the buyer will take over those for whatever it's costing you. And for the next one to three to five years, however you want to set it up, 
But what you usually do is you put a date in where the seller can pick the date, and then you have a formula, three times earnings. So he or she makes exactly what they would have made based on their productivity, and they get a sales price after we've already done the transition. The clients know where the parking lot is. They recognize the receptionist. Your people are already used to this environment. They've either quit and been replaced and your clients know them, or they're still there. Because let's face it, for a lot of us, our clients are working with our assistants as much as us. If the assistants stay and the work gets done properly, we're probably more fungible than we want to admit. Um, you know, there's work till you die. Nothing wrong with it if it's what you want, but how do you want it, the outcome for your employees? How are you going to cover your, your um, customers? I've got a friend right now. He's made a couple referrals to me. He's 72. And a, a couple of the referrals I've been working with on these types of things for five or seven years now. And they're starting to say to me, what are we going to do when something happens to Bob? Now, Bob is terrified that if anybody finds out he's exit planning, they're going to leave. That's gravity. You know, his clients want to know how they're going to be taken care of. Um, sell to family. I'm not going to spend time here. I grew up in a family business. Um, I'm the black sheep. Uh, so I can tell you all the good and bad of that. Um, right now, especially for accountants, a lot of roll-ups going on. Um, can be a very good outcome if you got what they want. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. The biggest issue with options is they take time. Again, if you're, if you're bringing in this associate, you know, bringing in the miracle guy or gal a year before you need them to close and they're going to take over everything and run it well, doesn't happen. Five years before, if they look like they're the right person, we can train them. We can bring them in. If they're not the right person, we can replace them at four years, and we still have time. Same thing with any element of this. If, you know, you should be financial planning for your retirement from the day you get out of college, if, if you can. You know, that's preparation for this. When people come to me and they go, you know, I really want the $2 million. I do, but I don't need it. It's like, whew, such a relief for all of us because sometimes things change on their side. You know, if there, something happens on their side that increases risk and they're not going to get the 2 million. So it's, it, that's a big piece of it. So again, look at this early plan early. It takes a long time. It, like I said, if you have a law practice and a couple associates, you know, if you want them to pay for you, You've got to figure out how to make it a value and lock them in when there's something for them to lose five or seven years out. There's lots of ways to do it, but it doesn't work a week before. Um, and then post-closing, you know, how long are you, if you're a law, lawyer, you've got personal goodwill. It's one of the few areas in my mind that really still has personal goodwill. You've got to be there a while and transfer it you're going to probably have a note. Those are five to 10 years in a lot of cases. So this thing takes a long time. And I'm a big proponent of salaries, which I know the bigger accounting firms, it's what they use. And the reason I say that, well, how can I give tax advice to you guys? But if you look at, you know, principal payments on a purchase price, while it's capital gains to my seller, which is a woo-ha, my buyer has to earn that money and pay ordinary rates to then pay you to get capital gains. I can't tell you what's going to happen next. Every equation is slightly different, but often it's better to pay the seller a little more, a little more as salary because if I add the two taxes where we can control that, it becomes much more tax, it may become more tax efficient. And if they remove the capital gains, which you all know more about than me, um, it could happen. Right. The other thing, even when he's past being gone, 
is if something goes wrong, it's a lot easier. Look, if the guy's doing everything he or she should do and the market just isn't giving them a chance, it's a lot easier to adjust your salary than renegotiate notes and, you know, did, did I now have a gain? And it's just, it, that for a lot of reasons, it makes sense. The next thing I want to talk about is your best buyer. Everybody comes to me, and I just did a transaction, and, and David may or may not realize all this. He referred it to me, and he did the legal. Um, but my seller wanted to get bought by like an FTI, or, and, and he had a really solid operation, 20 people working under him, but he was still the center guy. And I called 25, and it wasn't easy to find him. He was in a specialty area consulting. I, call, I did find like 25 big companies, and I called the area level partner, the head partner. I called them all. And they were all like, well, how do we replace his salary or his work? How do we replace his work? There's not like three of them where two of them are staying. Our guys of this caliber, you know, we don't have them just sitting around on the bench. This isn't a baseball team. So in your field, you got to think about that. Now, in the end, we sold them to a very qualified individual who wanted to be him. He had the time. It made, that was what made the most sense. Um, so your best buyer is very important. And often it's not who you'd like it to be. Um, and, you know, this is just a basic qualification chart. The first step is, can they finance? You know, if they can't finance, or you can't work out a deal to finance them, they may be the nicest people in the world, but they're not a buyer. Every buyer has a list of never buys. A big one is, maybe not in this, is I'll never do a stock sale. So all you guys running around with little C-corps, don't tell them, oh, you'll just do a stock sale. It'll be easy. That is, they're going to take a discount for that. I'm not saying we won't do it, but there's an awful lot of people who won't take the liability risk of that. Are they motivated? You know, if you're not motivated, I often think I'm a very good negotiator. But if you couldn't care less, it's like pushing an earthworm. Leadership experience, again, I sort of talk about that. And at a higher level, it does not need financing. You know, part of the reason Google can pay such crazy numbers, besides the fact that they're doing things where they might have crazy leverage, is there's nobody, you know, there's no bank. There's no bank appraiser. That's a third wheel in your negotiation if you want a bank in there. And... As I tell my sellers, when the bank comes in, we're going to give something. We, we, we're likely going to give something away. I don't know what it is. But I know the bank, if you want the money, we're going to listen to the bank. Um, so people who don't need it are really fun, especially if they're really motivated. And then, of course, synergies. We all know what synergies are in this room. If they have synergies, Here's the thing, if they have synergies, they can pay more. Don't mix that up with what I said earlier about buyers pay what they have to. So if you don't create a situation where they feel like they have to pay more because they can, you're probably not gonna get it. And our next polling question, so it ties into what I just covered. Do you know who your best buyer is? And, and this is where I know we're gonna trip you up. Have you talked to three of them about just, you know, I'm thinking of exit planning. I'm 10 years off or five years off. Again, you don't want to do this two weeks before you want to get out. I'm 10 years away. But what do you guys look for? Have you ever thought about it? You'll learn a lot. You also may find out if they have a little interest. Maybe we can do some common projects. Maybe there's some ways we can get to know each other. Now, if you do that real well, you'll never call me for brokerage. So, um, so how many people have done that? Any yeses? Okay, that's what I figured. Oh, I got 60% claiming yes online, three of them. I got to meet these people. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, these are not questions you're supposed to pass, but they're very relevant and true. And, and, and I'm a big proponent, seriously. If you're way in advance, go talk to them. They'll tell you stuff. They'll tell you who's going to take over your hours or whatever it is. Because what you want to do is you want to shape this thing as you're exiting towards your best buyer. So the next one, it's all about the numbers. And I kind of say this with a certain level of it is and it isn't. We're going to talk about both. And I'm two minutes behind. Oh, you know, every accountant has said this to every client I have ever had. You will only sell for peanuts versus what you make every year. Now, peanuts is an accounting term of art. And we all know what it means. Why would you do this financially to yourself? And I sort of get it, um, except sometimes people actually do, you know, where we started, what do you really want to do? What would you like to do next? There's a lot of people out there who have that, or something starts happening to their friends, or they have health issues, and all of a sudden they have them if they didn't before. Um, and if you sort of plan for this in advance, it gets easier. And, and here's why you want to do the planning. And this is a little more of an industrial company. I didn't change all the percentages. But basically, this is a company with 10 million of revenues. And both of the charts start at 10 million of revenues. And they got like a 70% cost of goods sold and, and 2 million of overhead. Now let's talk about overhead. Especially if you're getting tired, not paying attention, you're sick. You know, as your revenues fall, just 10% a year, kind of rounded for simplicity. As your revenues fall 10% a year, your overhead probably does not fall. And if it does, it does not fall 10%. It probably falls one or two or three. So what happens? Remember that cash flow formula? So the gold is what you sell for. You start at 4 million. Well, three years out, you're at a million six. Should that person, if they were ready, have sold on the first year as fast as they could, maybe take three, eight, make it a good deal for someone because they, because they're no longer interested. I think they should have. This is what you do if you just grow 10% a year and you keep that overhead tight because you yeah, know, you know, you're going to sell and they'll figure it out when they get it. You're up to 6.4, same company. It's just math and a lot of work. Don't get me wrong. A lot of work. You're adding a lot of people here. You better have systems as you do this or you're not going to. I work with a lot of construction companies. A lot of them, the more work they do, the less money they make because they don't have the middle management. Um, just to emphasize, and I call this, again, dog chasing its tail. Don't be the dog because I get people who call me every one of those years. Can I sell for four? I tell them you sell for four and they go, can I sell for five? Nope, four. Four, maybe four and a half, but not five. Let's not waste our time. They call you next year. Can you get me four? Well, remember that formula? And they never sell. Don't be the dog. This is the dog. This is you. If, if you put a plan together and at least keep things going. I had an accountant. Honest truth ties back to gravity. He got off. He was sick for three months in tax season. Now he had a nice old firm. He had about 10 people, a couple professional level. Three months, missed the whole tax season. He's got this big welt. I don't know what it was, but you know, it worried me in his stomach because I'm talking to him in like May or June. I think I should sell. I'm like, yeah, I think you should. We find a buyer in the next building over because of his health. He wasn't even willing to promise that he'd be able to do any transition. So he figured if it's the next building over, his staff would probably be okay with the drive. Good firm, good people. You know, they were trying to grow. The guy felt better for two weeks through the deal, spent the next tax season in the hospital, and had nothing left to sell. His people just left with his firm at that point because they weren't putting up with it. That's defying gravity. Don't be the dog. And that's why if you're really done, yes, you will only get three times what you make in a year. We don't kid about that. But that's the first thing I tell you. So when your clients come to you, well, this is more about you. If your clients come to you and want to talk about this, 
if they were working with honorable people, that's the only thing they do know. All this other stuff they need to work through, who are they? What are they doing next? How involved are they going to be or not be? It's all the emotional stuff. This is my piece that is not the numbers. And, you know, the problem is a trained monkey like me can figure numbers out. I hate to say it. I apologize if you're offended. But culture, are your people and my people going to get along and actually create a synergy? Or are they going to fight and I'm going to lose two-thirds of what I'm buying? Because what am I really buying with companies like ours? I'm buying people who know those processes and can operate them seamlessly and get excellent results every time. So if they all quit because they hate the new guy, it didn't really work. Even, even if you somehow managed to keep it going, you didn't get what you could have got. So do look at culture. If, they're, if you're joining a roll-up, get a list of everybody they've acquired, including the ones that didn't work. Call them. Nothing's going to work all the time. But, you know, it's good to know what you're getting into. They're going to tell you a few things that you'll be glad you knew. And don't forget the rest of due diligence. I meant to put a link here. I didn't. If you want a very good due, oh, I think it's a good due diligence sheet, send me an email. Let me know here. I'll get it to you. Also, look at it as you're a year or two or three out. What am I missing? What should, what can I improve? We try to do that with our small clients. Most of them won't get us the stuff. But you know, even if you've got a problem, if we know what it is, we can sell around it. People, there's people who deal with almost anything if it doesn't shock them. So the next part is write down what your goals are. How much would you like to sell this for? What terms would you like? And I know we'd all like all cash at closing. And I'm not saying you can't have that, but you've got that takes more advanced thought because you've, you've got to have a machine I'm more comfortable with. If I'm really going to give you all cash versus I'm going to do you on some sort of earn out or I'm going to take a note and if anything goes wrong, we've got a right of offset. You know, those are ways we cover the risks when we can't convince the person that this is, you know, I'm buying the apple as an apple and this is a tasty one. It, it doesn't have any rot in it. Otherwise, I'm, you're gonna finance my apple and after I eat it, if, if there's no rot in there, I'll pay you full price. Um, it's shifting of risk. Who's your buyer? Again, if you get anything out of this, and you're not a year away or six months away, find a way to go talk to the bigger firm you'd like to merge with, the firm your own size. You might like to you know, work out a, a risk sharing. If something happens to me, maybe you'll do it so that my clients don't get left hanging. The different things, you know, this all ties in. You know, a really good sellable firm is a firm you don't even want to sell because it's, it's pretty fun to run. Things are working. So write down those and write down some options, you know, because options give you flexibility. The one thing I always tell my sellers is let's put in there that we'll consider financing. Let's put in there whatever it is a buyer might want and let's hear from them because every now and then someone is so willing to pay a premium if we do it their way that it's worth it. It's certainly worth listening to. This uh, probably applies more in my pure accounting than my accounting law. I attend a lot of the valuation conferences. And the guy gets up there, and he's a very good valuer. Should be doing divorces all day long. And he goes, well, it was a, like I started with, it was a 24% cap rate, and I got it knocked down to 22%, and he didn't pay that giant broker fee. I did him a great favor. Well, okay. And on the stand, that may be a great resolution. And maybe it was, because I don't know the rest of the facts. But you know, when you go into a car dealership, at least has been my experience, I always gravitated towards that car. Whatever version it was at whatever dealership, that's emotion. I went to that car. Okay, 
we bought the minivan. We just bought the four-wheel drive SUV because we're in the mountains a lot. But my emotion, I would just at least let me take it out for a spin, right? And emotion drives this. I don't even care if it's big companies. you got one or two or three people who they're emotionally committed or this isn't going to happen. I even call this the business cycle in emotions. And right now we're in greed. We got people doing silly things. God bless them. I hope it works out. Um, I feel bad for them when it doesn't because I like my buyers and I want my deals to work for everybody. Less in, less in these industries. Um, you know, but then something's going to happen. The interest rates are going to go up. Mortgages are going to, you know, foreclosures are going to go through the roof because everybody's buying on their payments at 3%. Now it's at 5%, so nobody can buy. And then we're going to have denial. I'll, I'll go to closing. It looks bad, but I'll do it. And then, and then we have fear and panic and foreclosure, right? And the smart people buy at relief. Maybe at foreclosure, relief. But if you want your best price, you want excitement. Don't wait for greed. We're not that good as humans of guessing what it's going to be. As I tell people, valuation is forward-looking. If I could really predict the future, I'd buy a couple stock options every morning and be done. Um, so don't, don't try to hang out too long on it. So these are the keys to a high price, and I actually sort of made these click down. Again, when I'm qualifying that person, the other thing that isn't on the chart is what is the motivation? Are we trying to have the biggest law firm? You know, we want to be a top 10 accounting firm, and we're at 15, and boy, you guys can move us another notch. Okay. Now, when we get stuck on price, when my seller comes back 10% too high, then you go, I can't do that. I'm going to say, hey, you want to be a top number 10 accounting firm, right? Yes, we do. Well, I know you don't like this 10% price, but if you paid that 10% price, is it really going to keep you from getting your goal that's all. And they're going to tell me, <laughs> but that night, that person isn't sleeping. And they're going to come back 90% of the time. And maybe they don't give me all 10, but they're going to give me five or seven or eight. What do people want? And remind them through questions. So they're answering. I could, I could tell them, oh, well, you're going to get what you want anyway. And it means nothing. When they answer the question to themselves, that's a nightmare. The other one is have somebody that really could take the cake. Here's my other offer. It's a little different, but it's pretty good. We're leaning towards it. Now, no matter how much people tell me I won't get in a com bidding competition and I won't, if they like what they're seeing, they've, they're already, they already made the money. And losing it, that's when you find out what they'll really pay, if, if, if that's what's important to you, is getting the highest price. If you want to sell to your employees and make sure it all lives on, you probably have a good reason to not want the absolute highest price. Um, but that's what negotiation is. That's far more effective. You know, at some point, we all start arguing cap rates and multipliers, but that's a loser for us if you're a seller compared to someone else is going to take it. I, I feel terrible. I like you so much. And someone else is going to take it. And improving results. Hire a broker so you can focus on keeping your results. This is emotional. Anything going sideways scares people. We kind of talked about this again. Quietly get the word out. Make it easy. So my last big one. Pitfall number seven is do it yourself. And this woman's face says it all, doesn't it? And here's what I have to say about that, especially in this room. Really? You're really, you guys that get paid 300, 500, 700 an hour because of your expertise are going to try to do this on your own? Remember the two men and the three men in the beginning and you knew it was a trick? Well, usually I use it the other way because when we get into technical stuff, even negotiating, logic often doesn't work. 
every seller I've ever met says, I would prefer not to take back financing. And I get that. And if they try to sell themselves and they're in a market where they may not take back financing, they probably won't. But I have found over and over and over, if I go to a seller, to a buyer, and I say, look, we can't cut your 15, 20%. In fact, we're going to raise you 5%. But my seller feels so good about you. You are the person. And, and this is true, or they wouldn't be selling to them because this is their baby. They feel good about you as the successor to take this to the next level. They feel so good that they're going to take back a 10% note and they're going to tie it into the reps and warranties because they know what they're telling you is the truth. And, they, so, and they're willing to share this risk. I'm telling you, especially when you get involved in SBA financing, it gets us more cash at closing. It's a bonus. And I tell my sellers, you may, if you don't collect this, don't come back and yell at me. It's bonus money. It got us more. I can't prove it definitively, but we've done this for years. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. You all are experts. You know all these people. Sometimes when I'm talking to contractors, they don't. You guys know these people. The only thing I will say is everybody is really leery to hire improvement contractors. And by that, I don't mean home improvement. I mean consultants that can help you with your marketing or teach you a sales process. Sales is a process. You guys know it or you wouldn't be here. But a lot of the junior people don't. You know, they're terrified of it. Somebody that can speed it up, even if they cost 10, 20, 30,000. You know, if they can make you, if they can really show you how, and some can't, they can really show you how to make 50 more this year and 100 more this year, next year, that's your best return on investment you ever got. So I understand the fear, and you want to make sure you're hiring the real deal, who's got clients that like them. And we all got at least one, so hear from a few. Um, but in some cases, if you've really got a blotch that you think you can fix in, in your time frame, or you want to take your practice to the next level, you're 10 years away, consider that. That's a sign of loving what I'm talking about. <laughs> so write down your team, folks. Write them down. You've got financial planners. Nobody in this room doesn't have a financial planner except me, and I am the worst self-financial planner on earth. You know, who do you trust that can help you do an evaluation and can look at, okay, what are we missing? We do a tremendous number of calculations of value. If you're 10 years away, it doesn't need to be perfect. I didn't say that. It, it needs to be reasonable so you can plan because it's gonna be completely different in a year because we do valuations as of a date. Now, if you're gonna sell to your employee in two months, we better do an opinion of value and check out every little detail. Don't, don't get me wrong, there's different uses. But you know, who's on your team that can help you look at it from that? Who can help you fix your issues if you have them? Do you know a business broker, investment banker, whatever? They probably, you know, brokers love to talk. You probably talk to them for an hour, they can tell you all kinds of things you didn't know, especially if they work some in your area. Um, you know, so write down your team. And then I have the, I believe the last polling question. So, and this is sort of a back to what's the status of my business. Um, how many of you in the last two years, and I'll give you three, took a week off and didn't call, text, email, check the website, whatever it is that you track for more than an hour in that week, like the business, the practice actually ran itself. How many of you actually did that? One. Okay, we got it. Good. That's awesome. Because usually we don't have that. And I can't do that. It's I, I, I got bad habits. Um, oh, my miracle people. None of them did that. Six for six. How about that? You guys won. The room won, folks out there. <laughs> You know, I use that as an acid test. If, if, if you can take a week or two weeks, I, I, as a bonus, I had two weeks. We won't worry about that. If you can take a week off in the 
place comes back and it's actually in good shape. Um, the client I mentioned earlier that David sent me, he didn't really want to sell. He didn't. I mean, he thought he did. He had all these reasons. Remember what I started with? Where's your gut? Then he got very, very, very sick. And we found out two things. One, his firm could run itself, which was kind of nice for him because he was out for three months. I mean, completely out. Then he came back and did a lot of work, but um, his firm could run itself. And, and that's huge because, again, if you want to retire at some point, they're not buying you. I got fired from a woman once. She ran a small consulting firm. And, you know, I wrote up the package discounting her because we want to sell her. And she sat me down and yelled at me how I didn't understand how important she was and fired me. Well, I guess it was probably a good thing um, because she didn't get planning. So if you can do that, try to do that as a goal. It's a great test. So lastly, I kind of call it don't ignore gravity. You know, I was raised by a contractor, as I already mentioned. So life was a Gantt chart. This was back, you know, before everything was on the computer. And we'd print the big architectural sheets with the Gantt chart schedule. And you would highlight what you'd done on your critical path. And you had a, you had a, you know, chalk line of the, on the date. So you could see whether you were ahead or behind. I mean, it, you didn't have to be very sharp to know this. And that's how we ran our lives. If you don't put dates on this, it's okay. If you miss the dates, it's okay. But if you won't put dates on it, you won't ever say, oh man, I need to get to that. And it'll sort of be like where we started. Well, the biggest thing is people don't start with a plan, which is why if you took advantage of this and you wrote some things down, this got a lot more real to you. But you got to put some dates. When, and, and I picked some milestones you know, that I think are pretty damn important. Now, when am I going to assemble this team? I'm not somebody that says you got to get all six people billing you a 500 an hour around a round table looking at you. Some people like to operate that way. If you do, it doesn't hurt. But make sure you're telling them all the same story and they're hearing you so that your financial planner isn't making one assumption and, and you know, your valuation guy another and you know, make sure that you're telling them all the same story. When are you going to assess what you got realistically? Like a buyer, you know, like a buyer. That's what brokers do initially. You know, it's really funny wearing the two hats because you come in and it's like, I'm looking at it like a buyer and here's all your problems. Now, I need to know that to discount them when I'm selling you. But if I don't know them, we're not going to get anywhere. Same thing with you. There's always a way to improve your practice. There's always something you could do better. Assess it from that perspective and then make some, a detailed, you know, more detailed of when you're going to accomplish these goals. When are you going to finalize what your real goals are? And that, and final, you know, final isn't final until you're dead when it's your life. Let's be real. But something that's pretty damn close, at least as close as it could be today. Now, I do valuations as of a date. And tomorrow, it could all be different. The day after they shut the world down for COVID, my valuations with a date three days before really didn't mean a whole lot for a while. Same thing with when you're planning for yourself. Something could happen to change it, but do the best you can. You know, when are you going to do, what are you going to do to improve the place? If you're five or seven years off, how are you going to build the practice you really want? The practice where you're not working 90 hours tax week, where you can take some time off, you know, have soft conversations. And I say this both with likely prospects and with your employees. Again, when I, in that question, said doing exit planning with your staff. Now, I don't mean the receptionist, but if you've got people who may want to buy you, this is an opportunity. This is a challenge. How do we get to these benchmarks? How do we build you up so you can do this, play this part in this game? It's not terrifying to them. 
It may be, the, it may be what they want to do with their life. And if it isn't, and you want somebody internally to buy you out, you might need to get out on the street while you still have time to find that person. Have conversation. When, when owners come to me and go, should I talk to them? Well, I'm a broker. We're nine months from closing, theoretically. If this person's that important, you know, they, they, could, they could try to hurt you. Or they may decide they really, they've not liked it here and now they're going anyway. But if they're five years out, and they don't like the idea. Well, you got, you got time to do things about it. You're better off knowing. You're, if they're not the people on the bus that you need, but you can't do that, you know, when you're not feeling well and you need a transaction real fast. So I, I'm a big believer, you know, bring your key people in. Have a planning process. You know, a planning process is where you give them, when you speak, they're going to say what you said because you're the boss. But if you bring them in and ask them their goals, what they would like to do, how can, what I find often is you got to tone them down. They can't meet the goals they're willing to set for themselves. If they're the people you really want on the bus, they can't because they want to make it happen. They want to prove themselves. People in general, at least this is my philosophy, want to do things and achieve. Now, some of them can't, that's, but they want to. And if you bring them in and now they set the goals, maybe you tone them back but they're in the game with you. You're gonna have to adjust them to what makes sense. You're gonna have to make them fit 10 other things they're not thinking about, but leave it that they're in the game with you. And exiting can be a big part of that. If you need a broker, bring them. And when do you actually wanna do this? You know, what, what's the deal date? And, and you know, maybe the deal date is when you sign them and they buy 10% a year, or you give them 10% a year, or however you structure it that makes sense for the facts on hand. It's not necessarily the day you're never going back in the office, at least from my point of view. So to me, you got to have a plan. You got to have a critical path. It doesn't matter whether you're the partner that gets to set all this stuff, or if this is just for your career or your small practice. If you sit down and think through these things from where you are and write them down, there's something meaningful about write them down and look at them quarterly at least. You'll find you just from that, you'll be surprised in a year or two, you'll start moving towards it. That, that, that's, that's how we're programmed. You know, what we think about becomes our habits. Our habits become what we are.